Okay, hello everyone. How's everyone? Hello, humans out there. Hello, hello. Uh, I'm Avery Willis Hoffman. I'm the artistic director of the Brown Arts Institute. I'm so, so happy to welcome you here. The first thing I'm gonna do is an official fire safety. So forgive me for 35 seconds while I read this fire safety announcement and then we'll get to, to, to the fun. Uh, so the, in, in the event of a fire alarm, please proceed calmly to a nearby exit, leave the building and move away from the doorway. Please note the location of nearby exits. The closest exit may not be where you entered be aware that the way you entered may not be the most direct way out. Sitting or standing in the aisles and doorways is not permitted. Smoking is not allowed inside any university building. And please turn off or silence all pagers, I don't know if anyone has a pager these days, uh, and cell phones. So thank you, that's the official language. Um, so welcome everyone. Um, how many folks are here from the School of Public Health? Amazing, fantastic. Well, you are so welcome here in the Granoff Center. Um, we are just thrilled to be hosting you all tonight. Um, this is just the beginning of several conversations across the year, um, and I'm really happy to be welcoming you. Um, we have begun uh, a really wonderful series called Ignite. Uh, and this is one of our very first events uh, as part of the Ignite series. It's a, a series of events um, that are gonna happen across campus um, in various buildings. You may or may not know, we just opened the Lindemann Performing Arts Center across the way uh, last weekend, I think it was last weekend. Um, and so we will be hosting um, various uh, events in that building and this building here and various uh, places across campus. Um, so we're super thrilled to begin here um, a set of conversations across the year. Um, and I want to uh, give a special thank, thank you to the School of Public Health and to um, Dr. Jennifer Galvin, who is of course a, a Brown alumna and a scientist and a filmmaker and um, is uh, proposed this uh, film series to us and we're just super thrilled to be um, beginning that tonight. So I'm gonna turn everything over to uh, Dr. Jennifer Nezzo, uh, who's gonna introduce the panel tonight and the film. This is a special pre-release screening, so we're, we're super thrilled to have you. So, Dr. Jennifer. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Thank you so much for coming. It's really thrilling for me to see everybody here. Uh, as, um, Avery, thank you so much for that uh, warm welcome and kind introduction. I'm Jennifer Nezzo. I am a professor of epidemiology and director of the newly created Pandemic Center at the Brown University School of Public Health. And I'm really thrilled uh, to be welcoming you here to not only the screening, but this series of events that we are uh, launching. Um, tonight's event marks the start of a new series that we are um, operating here at the Pandemic Center and in partnership with the Brown Arts Institute. It's called Our Storied Health. And it is a year-long film uh, and media and workshop series that's going to explore how we can use storytelling and narrative to improve public health. The seeds for Our Storied Health uh, were sown uh, maybe uh, many years ago, but <laughs> acutely three years ago. Um, I, as someone working in pandemic preparedness and response, uh, had been talking to a lot of people throughout COVID-19. But three years ago, I was a researcher who uh, was trying to understand what was happening with the rollout of COVID-19 vaccines. And if you remember at the very beginning when the vaccines first came, became available, they were initially uh, prioritized for healthcare workers. And so wanting to understand how the rollout of this completely new vaccine with some uh, interesting operational requirements was going. Uh, we partnered with a number of healthcare institutions to kind of see how that was going and to, to understand what was happening. And what I learned in doing that research was that there had been a tremendous amount of work that went on to figure out how they were gonna figure out who to give the limited quantities of vaccine to, how they were gonna store this vaccine that required very, very cold temperatures, how they were gonna administer it such that they didn't waste it. But one thing that we didn't have a plan for is what to do if people didn't want it. 
And what we started hearing were stories of healthcare workers, some of whom were working on the front lines of some of the hardest hit hospitals, declining the vaccine, not wanting to get vaccinated, resisting what later became institutional mandates that were in part necessitated because of that pushback. So these were people who had seen firsthand the effects of COVID, uh, had been educated about the, the impact of the uh, disease as well as the, the benefits and the uh, protective nature of the vaccines. And nonetheless, those facts were not enough to convince them. So for me, that became, that was a moment that instilled a lot of clarity that uh, we in public health need to really rethink how we approach communication. That just simply repackaging facts is not enough to reach people. And um, you know, we have to now in, in public health, uh, you know, think about new approaches and new tools. We have to try to rise above the sea of mis and disinformation uh, that's out there, lies on social media. We're also competing for people's attention. We're not just informing, we're trying to reach and change hearts. So over the next year, our storied health uh, is going to be exploring how to use other tools, namely the arts, to reach people about the most pressing health issues that face our nation and our globe. We are proud to be hosting this screening and the whole series in partnership with Brown Arts Ignite, which if you don't know is Brown University's multi-year series of creative activations, interventions, and investigations produced by communities across Brown, Providence, Rhode Island, and beyond. So tonight is our first uh, in this event of the series. We're going to be viewing uh, the film Shot in the Arm, which is a look into the rising anti-vaccine movement in the United States. Um, as Avery mentioned, this film has not been released, so you're getting a privileged, advanced uh, look at the film. Um, and it's important to point out that the film was started, they started making this film before the pandemic. Um, the filmmaker uh, really started exploring the rising uh, anti-vax sentiments that were creating real problems when the United States was battling uh, multiple outbreaks of measles and was at risk of losing for the first time our measles elimination status. Uh, it's now clear to anyone who's lived through the pandemic that uh, the rising anti-vax narrative has only gotten worse uh, throughout the course of the pandemic and now seems uh, likely to stay unless we actively work to diffuse it and combat it. And interestingly, I met the filmmaker, um, Scott Hamilton Kennedy, uh, at, at a, um, a panel discussion that we were both on in, in conjunction with um, the, the preparation to release this film. That uh, happened on the day that Robert F. Kennedy Jr. announced his, uh, that he was running for president, as if to really solidify the notion that this anti-vaccine movement is something that we have to take quite seriously. So we're gonna talk about that, but really the purpose of the screening and our conversation that we're about to have before that is to talk about storytelling and narrative and, and other tools that we can use to reach people's hearts and minds. And um, fortunately, to help us kind of unpack that a bit and talk about how we can uh, use new approaches to reach people, uh, we are joined by two really extraordinary people uh, who have been uh, d dedicating their lives and careers to, to just that. Uh, we have uh, with us tonight uh, Maggie Fox and Dr. Jen Galvin. Um, Maggie, I'm sure you have seen her byline in many places. She's a journalist and a writer who's covered health, medicine, and science for a variety of venerable outlets such as Reuters, NBC News, and CNN. She also runs an amazing podcast on One Health uh, that you should definitely check out. Um, I've known Maggie for a long time. She's been reporting on a number of uh, events that are of direct uh, relevance to our pandemic center. And um, uh, I've talked to a lot of journalists in my career, and Maggie in particular is really well regarded for covering uh, issues uh, accurately, um, but also in, a, in an engaging way, which is really important and why I'm so glad. And um, I saw a clip that her work was featured on The Daily Show, and I hope she brings that up and talk to us about what that was like. Um, then we also are gonna hear from Dr. Jen Galvin. Uh, uh, Jen is a public health scientist and environmental scientist turned prize filmmaker. Uh, her work has really driven by her unrelenting determination to try to make positive change in the world. And so she brings to her to that work uh, really kind of her uh, triple threat of expertise in um, science, media, and catalytic investment. 
And I have to share with you her most important biographical detail, which is that Dr. Galvin is a Brown alumna, a very proud Brown <laughs> alumna. So welcome home. <laughs> So anyway, let's get back into it. I'm gonna join you and then we're gonna have a conversation. We would like to have question and answer, so start thinking of things you wanna ask these folks. Um, so I wanna kick off the conversation and just hear a little bit about your kind of personal and professional journeys as storytellers. How did you get into telling stories about health? Uh, what motivated you, you could have worked on anything, why choose health and stories? So uh, Maggie, I'll start with you. Well, I, I was originally a war reporter. I was reporting from the Middle East, from Lebanon, and it's, it's all, everything comes full circle, right? But I decided that wasn't hard enough. It wasn't difficult enough to try to tell people why they should care about the difference between Sunnis and Shiites, and, and why Israel was coming over Lebanon's southern border. So um, I thought, well, what could be harder? How about um, health and science? That's, it's not that facile. <laughs> But um, in, in the news business, you, you move from beat to beat. And I had been covering conflict and politics. And we weren't covering health and science in the way that we should. And it's engaging and it's important. And I'd always loved science. And I realized that you could take the medical and scientific journals and report on those stories. And they had instant news value because they had just been published and came to understand that's how the scientific world works. But I don't think most people understand that. Um, so I, I was kind of learning about how that world works at the same time as I was developing the beat and found it infinitely fascinating. It's something that affects everybody all the time. And there's horrible stories like pandemics and outbreaks of disease. One of the first big stories I covered was mad cow disease in the UK. And then on the other spectrum, you have space. And you can talk about interesting cosmic discoveries and uh, planetary science and space exploration. And those are stories that people love to hear. And I've stuck with it ever since. Uh, well, I'm very grateful to you for doing that. I'm very... Uh... Uh, humbled in <laughs> thinking about that uh, reporting on that seems harder than reporting on the Middle East. Uh, we definitely have our work cut out for us, but glad we're having these conversations. Um, Jen, uh, you got your doctorate in public health and just uh, stunned everybody by not going for a postdoc. Uh, yeah. You decided to turn your talents and uh, expertise into filmmaking. Tell us about that. Yeah, stunned, I, stunned is the, the right word. I think most of my colleagues at Harvard, except for Jennifer Nuzzo, <laughs> thought I had maybe um, you know, needed a little extra sleep and make a different decision. But yeah, I finished my, my doctorate at HSPH and decided to start filmmaking. I really just jumped into the deep end right away. Living in Boston for six years um, during my grad work there, I had kind of been exposed Boston's such a documentary hub, so I'd been exposed to some friends who are making docs and had worked with the New England Aquarium a little bit on their World of Water series, and I kind of understood who was at the table, how a project gets made, what, what it means to be a director or a producer or an editor. And um, yeah, for me, it just it seemed more like a natural transition. Um, a lot of people who were kind of firmly in my um, science world saw it as like a real, you know, kind of jumping ship or, um, or uh, you know, just kind of a very different decision. But for me, I always kind of saw the natural um, storytelling core of public health. You know, public health is um, kind of about how to account for connected experiences and events. And that is the very definition of narrative. How do we account for connected events and experiences? And so, um, it's just been like any other sort of decision. One thing leads to the next, and almost 20 years later, you know, here we are. <laughs> Prescient. Mm -hmm. um, so you're both communicators, but uh, for people who, you know, maybe in the health field or in other fields, like, how does the work of, you know, that you do when you thinking about, like, telling a story and, and having a narrative and communicating not just facts, like, how is it different than what uh, many people saw during the pandemic, scientists became communicators and they were you know, debunking things online or other things. How did, like, in your mind, what is storytelling? What is narrative? And, and what do you think its value is maybe kind of in comparison to kind of other forms of communication? 
Do you want me to go first? Sure. Um, so for me, you know, my form of storytelling was turning the lens, turning the camera, um, and I sort of shoot in a more observational style. Um, so for me, you know, thinking about, you know, s storytelling is really about letting, not pulling the story toward you, but letting the story lead you um, as a documentary filmmaker and really focusing on solutions and kind of societal assets. A lot of um, documentary filmmakers focus on a problem or a fight or a conflict. And my style has always been trying to bring the unseen into the light. I think that's why our storied health is so important in this moment. The, the time really is right now to help. Public health needs serious help with storytelling. Um, and you know, I think a lot of the unseen, invisible work of, of public health needs really to uh, be brought, in, brought into the light um, and, and focusing more on solutions than on, on problems. And I would say most of my work early on in my career as a health journalist was translating mm -hmm. science and medicine into plain English. Um, and it was, it was always a struggle. It was yeah. a, a struggle to, to, to take a, a, a dense scientific paper um, and tell people why it mattered. And what helps and what makes medical reporting so appealing is you can take a personal, someone's personal story, personal journey, and everybody cares. Everybody cares about their own health. Um, I made great use of people like you, Jen, right? You, you, when you're a journalist and you find someone who can say what this stuff means and says it clearly and in a way that's accessible, then you can let that person talk. And during the pandemic, of course, everyone's now used to seeing the researchers up there in front of the camera, which you didn't before. We, we health reporters would have to be the translators, but people in the field now know that they have to talk directly to people. We're still getting there. And, and, and I think that's what some of this discussion is about, right? How do you cross the border between someone who's an expert and then telling somebody why they should believe this person and, and take it in? But you do that with stories. Um, and, and that's always our tool. We, you know, especially in television, you have to have a face. You, you put a face to the story. Um, but we're finding even that hasn't been enough. And it's an intractable, intractable problem to get over this barrier of people choosing what they want to believe. And this idea of you get to choose your facts, you get to choose your sources, the phrase alternative facts. I mean, to your point about um, you know the why it matters. Uh, I think the like, so, I mean, scientific articles are typically shy of details on the why it matters, in part because you're speaking to an audience that already knows why it matters and uh, has been sort of following the story. You know, they're tuning in for the latest episode of your your article. They they know the backstory. They know they can anticipate what the future episodes are. You kind of know that scientific arc. But when you're communicating more broadly to people who aren't, you know, on the kind of inner circle of the research, uh, they don't know. And um, that, I think, is something that's challenging for us that I think is a is a skill that we have to learn to be able to say, this is why you should care, and to put yourself in the, in the you know, position of, of other people and why they should care. There's a flip side to that, uh, which is that sometimes we, I think as a field, overcorrect and uh, make <laughs> findings bigger than they ought to be, in a part because we think this is what we have to do to get attention. And, um, so maybe that brings me to my next question, which is thinking about, uh, it strikes me we're at a moment where not only as we are dealing with an information environment that's been you know, quite heavily poisoned by lies, but we're also competing for attention. We're competing for eyeballs. Um, you, I'm sure, you know, you've, you've worked in different types of media and um, you know, you have, I'm sure you have uh, thoughts about, well, how am I going to get people to read this? Will they care about this? I would love your, your insights of that. And Jen, you're trying to sell films, you're trying to make films. You know, you have to kind of make people think like, yes, this is something I want to watch. Um, you know, the, the, beyond just the, here's the importance of the issue. So I'd love your thoughts on, on sort of how you do that and what the, maybe the, the, the challenges of doing that are. Well, that's a, that's a really hard tension to break because, yes, in, in any newsroom, you're selling your story to the editors. You know, at a newspaper, it's like this deserves to be in the paper today. It deserves to be on the front page. At a network, it's it's even 
there's even less time for that kind of stuff. And the, the, the refrain you would always hear from, from the producers of the shows was, is this a game changer? And you would want, as the reporter, to say, yes, it's a game changer, but science is incremental. Yeah. And that is not sexy. And it's really hard to explain that to people. To, and and to, to, A, make the story compelling, like the development of mRNA vaccines. Um, this is new. This is exciting. Oh, my God, they did it so fast. While at the same time saying, it's actually not that fast. Actually, they've been working on this for a really long time. And it's not until you get something like a Nobel Prize winner who got demoted at Penn State, right, at, at, at the University of Pennsylvania because you know, she, she wasn't getting the grants. It's rare that you get a good story and a good narrative like that. Yeah. It also makes me think that the scientific community is particularly bad at identifying game changers. So even harder to, to communicate why you should care about it. But um, any thoughts? Yeah, I just think, you know, we're, I see all of this as such an opportunity where the the general public now is is familiar with public health. You know, years ago, when I would say I studied epidemiology, friends of mine would think I was a skin doctor. You know, they just didn't know. And now people know what epidemiology kind of means. They're much more familiar with the discourse of public health and certainly know at least what a vaccine kind of does, whether, you know, no matter what side of the table they're on with that decision. Um, you know, I just think we're in, it's an incredible opportunity to harness um, people understanding and, and to push that more. And that's why we're doing this at Brown. You know, Brown is the place that pushes you. It, it is the place that wants you to engage in civic life. It wants you to, to do things differently. And it wants you to stitch together art and science. Um, so I think that, you know, we have a real opportunity here with our storied health to show films, do workshops, engage campus discussions around that very question, and hopefully to encourage more story making. I mean, that's my hope is that, you know, when you think about, you know, for, for me as a professional pitching projects and trying to get things made, and that's great because you need to put food on the table and do things that you love, but I also think, you know, so what? Make things that your community is asking for, make things that your community needs, make things that you want to make. Um, so I think, you know, now is not the time to say like, oh, I can't make a documentary about, you know, healthcare workers in, in the early stages of the pandemic because the market doesn't want it. It's like, so what? There's, there's an audience for everything, especially if your community needs it. So, yeah. That's helpful advice, mm -hmm. um, particularly for those of us thinking about pandemic issues and recognizing that uh, there's a, a society that's weary after three years mm -hmm. and not wanting to hear. And so how do we continue to tell the stories that need to continue to be told? Because as I heard today in one of the calls that I was on, you know, pandemic preparedness is a steady state. It is a year round endeavor. Um, I wanna give people an opportunity to ask questions uh, and we have mics. So um, it'll take a while for our mic runners to kind of get to you. So if you wanna ask questions, raise your hand. I'll keep the conversation going. I can't actually see anybody because the lights are very bright. So I'm gonna rely on the mic runners um, to do that. Thank you, Andy, um, for doing that. Um, great. Question about spokespeople. People, who are the right spokespeople? How do we get them into the stories? I have some feelings about this. And can we package that question in a larger conversation about how you think storytelling and communications went during the pandemic? Because you both have, uh, I've like, talked to both of mm -hmm. you during the pandemic and I love your, your insights on that. Um, this was a real problem during the pandemic. Um, trust was an issue during the entire Trump administration anyway. Um, the lack of trust in, in our, Institutions had been building even before the Trump administration. And of necessity, because it was a global pandemic, public health became a political issue. And that immediately cast doubt on everybody who was involved because you can doubt anything that comes out of a politician's mouth. And the public was unable to distinguish between who were the public health people and who were the politicians. Mm. You had all of these spokespeople appearing at the White House in these briefings. And it became very, very difficult to tell 
who was talking because they were a doctor and wanted the best for you, and who was saying this because they were a politician and it was their job to promote the White House. The White House, very rightly, in the world of politics, wanted credit for the mRNA vaccines, for the quick rollout of drugs, for the, the, the other public health matters that did, in fact, help, help slow the spread of the virus. But that really messed it up in people's minds. And that was a huge mistake, in my opinion. They wanted credit until they didn't want credit. They wanted credit until they didn't yeah. want credit. Okay, so I'll, I'll be careful with my words, but I will just say, you know, in, in general, I think public health um, needs a lot of help with storytelling. Um, I, I don't, you know, it, it's easy to kind of look back and, and point fingers, but I, in general, I, I don't think we did a great job. Um, as public health professionals in, in the communication space. There's just a lot of room for improvement, which is why we're here, which is why BAI is taking a chance on our storied health, because I think the, the time really is now to, to, to do this. Um, in answer to your question, messenger always matters. Um, and I think what, what matters to me as a public health professional and as a filmmaker is that, you know, ways that we can get stories more right is to really, you know, let characters speak for themselves and and try to find stories that help kind of showcase the very underpinnings of public health, which is that our daily choices, our daily health choices, don't just affect us as individuals, but affect others. Um, so I think that that is is key key for us in, in finding a, a way forward because we have not been doing a good job. I, I'm, oh, I'm, by, oh, I, I just want to say, don't, don't fall on your sword too badly. I'm not sure public health professionals fell down so much as the, the framework that you had to work in yeah. mm -hmm. had fallen apart. Um, people have been studying how to, how to communicate these things. The CDC and HHS back in the early 2000s had put together a lot of work on actually when the pandemic comes, because everybody knew a pandemic was coming, how to do this. It just came, the, the timing was horrible. I'm just struck though that like sort of the mm. the, the credence of of risk communication in public health as you're taught you know that the three tenets are be you know be first be right be credible, um, and it occurs to me that we're it's you know in in a social media era we're basically never going to be first. I mean it's going to be very hard for us to be first. Um, right, it's hard in an emerging situation to to fully be right, and we made some mistakes, and we have to I think own up to that uh, the mistakes. And then credible, increasingly, I would say, many people do not find the experts to be credible. And so those are some three challenges. So for me, I do think it requires a hard look at what we call this discipline of public health communication and whether we need new approaches. But we're also dealing with people who are weary and who are just saturated with all sorts of information. Mis or disinformation aside, they've got to, we've got, we're competing for attention. And What's going to get people's attention? Is it the facts, or is it something more interesting? Uh, and can we can we combine those two? Can we combine the facts with something that's more interesting, such that people actually want to receive that information? They don't push it away because, ugh, I'm so over that. Ugh, you know, it's been a long day. I'm not sure that I can handle hearing the news or the facts, etc. So, um, I see a yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. It's very. Uh, I, I just uh, want to ask a question about the gender that as a movie maker or like a documentary filmmaker as a woman, what's the, for both of you, what's the struggle in this very male dominated mm -hmm. media, like, you know, and also they always look for game changer or the hot story, but where you have a really human story that you want to pursue. So do you struggle to kind of an, do that in that, environment or it has improved a lot in after COVID? Yeah. <laughs> it's really difficult to find the story and it's hard to predict what kind of stories will take off. 
And I think everybody's struggling with that, right? You, you don't know what's gonna quote unquote go viral. And every news organization now has a, a social media editor who does nothing but look for quote unquote what's viral. And you report on something because it's popular, not because it's news. And it's almost impossible to get away from that. So in order to compete with that, you, you try to find a way of telling a story that will also go viral. And it's, it's not easy to predict, but the good news is that often the public health story is the one that people like. Um, I, I've had a successful career because the, the subject matter I write about is inherently interesting and people do click on it. One of the most viewed stories I ever wrote at NBC News was about a man who um, got, he had stage four esophageal cancer and he was um, speaking out in favor of vaccinating your kids against HPV, which is another vaccine that parents are hesitant about getting for their kids. And that was also one of these big vaccine discussions is, well, you know, I want to wait and see if there's any long-term side effects from the, from the vaccine. That story got more views than anything the entire year. Um, and it's kind of hard to pre predict why but it was inherently shareable. And I think that's the moment that you're looking for is to find a way to talk to people in a way that they're gonna go come away from it saying, I need to tell everybody I know about this, about either this movie I saw or this conversation I had or this guy I heard talking. And I love that in that though, you told the human story. You made it not just about like abstract statistics. You told about one person suffering and then what could be done to prevent that suffering in others and that made that really sort of a real thing for people as opposed to that's the problem with public health when it works that you don't see it, but you showcase sort of the, the very like human embodiment of it. And it's having people who are brave enough to come forward and tell their stories. And some of the most powerful stories we had during the pandemic were the vaccine doubters who got COVID, were in the hospital, and then they were very sorry. And yeah. You know, you, you, you didn't want to have the schadenfreude of saying, oh, ha, ha, they learned their lesson. It was more, here's this person who's told a powerful story. Anything to add? You know, just from a, a filmmaking perspective, um, you know, there's stories all around us. As a documentary filmmaker, just you have to um, respect that it's a very intimate thing to be invited into someone's life, to put a camera on, you know, on, on someone's life, and for these films to live forever. Um, so I just think, you know, as a, as a woman in film, I'm just very in tune to, to that um, level of uh, personalization with, with every story that I tell and to be really um, careful with, with the gift that people are giving me when they invite me into their, into their lives. So I think that kind of stitches together maybe two aspects of your question. Of course you do. Uh, you know, it's, it's a male-dominated world. Um, absolutely. And some of those guys can be big bullies. And I've always bet on the underdog, so I, uh, you know, don't let too much of that get in my way. But we're creating the next generation mm -hmm. and making an easier path for the future, so blazing the trail here. <laughs> I um, think there's time for one more question. Wonderful. Um, th thank you both uh, for being here all three of you actually. So I guess the question is, is storytelling, should that be part of the communication of science, communication of public health? And if so, <clears throat> how do we think about embedding this in our curricula in the way that we're training the next level of public health leadership to be facile at this? Yeah, I mean, I'm really excited to be the first filmmaker in residence at the Pandemic Center at the School of Public Health. That's one of the things I'd like to think about and maybe work on with, with Nazo and, and others. Um, one of the things that I would, you know, a pipe dream of mine would be to embed a filmmaker with, with every, every scientist here um, so that they're written into grants and they have you know, they're learning the, the, the language. It's really a language fluency, having them understand the projects from the very beginning. And, and then on the flip side, having the scientists understand what it means to you know, have a filmmaker or a storyteller on their team. So it doesn't feel like it's sort of an afterthought or just a gimmick to, oh, we're, we're gonna you know, do something 
you know, use it as a marketing tool to have it from the ground up, from the very beginning with every, every project, every study that's being pursued. I think it's essential. Um, and then I think there's so much room for doing something more in the educational space. I think Brown is the perfect place. I don't know that we have anything sort of documentary-centered um, with respect to classes here yet. Um, Please but let us know if you're in the audience. I think there would be a lot, of, a lot of room, room for that here. But I think um, we need to bring it into the public health education. One of the things that we're going to be doing with this series in between screenings, so the screenings are sort of showing us the... The fin like a finished product, um, but we want to in between host workshops to teach uh, storytelling in different forms so that uh, people interested in health, uh, whether you're a student, faculty, researcher, just general community member, uh, can come and learn the, this, like the tools and the skills of the craft. Um, and we'll think about different kind of formats that that could take so that we can uh, better incorporate that. Um, I, I can imagine if those workshops are successful as we anticipate they will be, then we could think about maybe ma more formalized instruction and think about how best to go about that. So maybe, a, maybe stay tuned and we're trying to figure it out, but we're doing something new here. So. I, I, I can only encourage you to do this. And one of the things I urge scientists to do is, is to lose their precision, lose their love of precision. One of the biggest mistakes that was made during the pandemic was this debate over aerosolized virus. And it was literally over the definition of what's an aerosol. And it was like, lose that. You guys need to lose that. And just you're talking to people and like, imagine how a virus might be transmitted. And it doesn't matter what size the aerosol is. And had people been thinking in more in terms of how do you talk to someone who's not a specialist, we might have been a little better off early on. Hmm. Yeah. Great. Um, I think we have to turn to the film. We have some great questions. Hopefully we can stick around afterwards and chat, um, but I don't want to preempt this film, which is what we're all here for. Um, so we are going to turn it over. And um, uh, just to say that this film is not yet out. It will be out soon. We are watching a version of it. Uh, I think the filmmakers we've heard are also working on a potentially longer version. So stay tuned for what the ultimate released version will be, but very much welcome hearing your thoughts afterwards and um, keeping the conversation going, not just tonight, but uh, throughout the year in their series. So um, thanks to everyone and take it away. <laughs> <laughs>